Good Thursday morning, y'all. Welcome on into your Great News Now community spotlight and happy July 4th. If you're watching us on this holiday, we really appreciate it. Go out and eat a hot dog and light some fireworks after you're done with us here. Speaking of fireworks, we've got the man of fireworks, Thomas Watson, joining us for your loaded and rolling community spotlight. Thomas, any fun plans for the 4th of July? Oh, man. The key is, uh, since we are in Chattanooga, you have to find a boat friend and go out on the lake. If not, you know, hot dogs, hamburgers, and uh, gunpowder-based fireworks. That's the, that's the important thing. The best kind of boat to have is a friend's boat. That's for dang sure. And it's been hot in the scenic city, so maybe you get on the water and enjoy that holiday a little bit. Before we get there, though, we want to talk about what's going on in the freight space right now, starting off with some pretty interesting metrics coming out of CCJ saying that leased owner operators are expecting to make even less money than they did last year. Not good news. Exactly. This is a survey data, so it's important when we want to get a pulse. Uh, when we have a little data chart, there's a difference between the company drivers and the leased owner operators. And one of the standout things uh, on the graphic that they published was that 52% of leased owner operators, when asked what they think they're going to make in this year compared to last year, they said that they're going to make less money than in 2023. That's over half. Uh, compared to company drivers, only a third of them thought they're making less money, a quarter of them thought they're going to make more money, and about 42% felt they're making the same amount of money. So the caveat, the interesting thing with this is because a company driver generally gets paid per mile, they don't have to pay for the maintenance and all the other costs. A leased owner operator or a, you know an owner operator is going to have to cover those extra costs. So what it really does show is that the higher costs uh, that are being passed through for carriers, they're going to impact the type of drivers differently. And just like we're talking about spot market conditions, even if you're under a large carrier, that may not mean that you're safe or on your own even. Yeah, I don't think that this data really comes as any surprise to us, right? Especially those of us who have been watching the way that the market has really been a drag on these folks for the last 18 months or so. And a lot of the conversation about capacity leaving the market has focused on those individual owner operators or those smaller operations, that one to five truck of capacity that have popped up in the last kind of three to four years. But I feel like we haven't really zoomed in on that least owner operator space. Do you have any insight or any thoughts on where the loss of capacity, if there is any coming out of that particular space? Or is are they still kind of hanging on for dear life, despite the fact that over half of them feel like they're going to make less money? So when we want to look at the, the health of a lease purchase, we have to kind of go around about on the edges. Uh, the, the stuff that John Kingston does with one of the Canadian uh, trucking companies that leases and does lending, that data is helpful. Uh, large companies like Tel, uh, TEL, and other ones who provide it, you want to pay attention if there's any recent company news. Because that's one of the underreported things is that the the lease purchasing agreement it's like you're 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 operating as your own owner uh, entity within an entity like a little rusted Russian nesting egg uh, compared to a company driver who doesn't have to worry about it and there was a really great uh, space on the X platform through Logistics Lounge recently that had Steve Vaselli Dr Vaselli has been doing research uh, he was a truck driver who is also a sociologist. And researcher at uh, UPenn, and he was doing research about the lease purchase model. So it's even more of a challenge because we need to start hearing if there's been any issues where these drivers can no longer pay for the truck. They're just simply having to break the lease uh, because it, it can be considered, uh, he called it, he alluded to it as more like a, if the market's bad, it can be a form of indentured servitude, but I won't go that far, but it is a situation where you have to read the fine print. So this is cool with CCJ because when we see owner operators, we think that they're you know small independent mom and pops. When we see the word leased in front of the owner operator, that's usually an indicator that it's under a large carrier and they're operating uh, through programs like getting the tires, you know, you're getting all the benefits of a large carrier, but you're also saving that large carrier the extra cost. So it's harder to find this data. So that's why when we find something like this, it's important. It's a little breadcrumb. I know that we've touched on, and you particularly have touched on predatory leasing practices and how that impacts the leased owner operator space. How do we think that that falls into line when we're talking about expectations for earnings for some of these folks? Are they going to likely be taking a closer look at some of those contracts they signed and, oh my gosh, to their discovery, I'm in a terrible predatory leasing practice and I can't get out? And if so, is there any recourse where, you know, I'm not making my money, I'm not making what I was promised, I need to leave? 
It is a very tricky situation. I'm really glad it's getting more attention. When I managed fleets and drivers, I saw firsthand what happened with lease purchase and owner operators in the system. Uh, oftentimes these companies will partner with the third party to protect them. That way you can't say it was the large fleet you worked for, it was actually the third party. The third party likes it because they can take the assets from the company and then they can lease those assets out and they're still making money off of it. So there, there is a debate. Right now, the issue is for a lot of drivers, they don't know what they're signing up for. Companies will not provide them or uh, with the full documentation. They'll say, well, yeah, no money down, no credit check, become your own driver. But then, oh, by the way, when you need to get more tires, that actually is your money. Or when you need to get something repaired, oh, by the way, this is another cost for you. So it is a, it is a situation where um, for, for a very long time in this industry, and this is my personal opinion, uh, not that of freight waves, but I do believe that it is exploitive of drivers and I, I do think there is this is the spicy take uh there is a very not knowing but there is a socialization where if you have a forced dispatch system and a company driver uh feels they can't pick their own loads you dangle this carrot saying well you can be your own boss you can pick loads in our network now but at the same time they don't understand that they're getting used equipment it may not be in good shape and by the time they do realize they may have been taken advantage of uh this lack of information this poor information environment it, it is very exploitive uh, for drivers. And uh, I do think that we do need to have something where it is simple. It's very plain to read. We need that kind of transparency because that way then the onus becomes you understood the risks instead of I'm trying to hide the risks from. Yeah, don't fall for the fancy wording on the back of the trailer that you see driving down the interstate because it might not be exactly what you sign up for. Thomas, it is the 4th of July holiday. We got to touch a little bit on the market because this is kind of that exact middle point of the year. And now we're getting to the point where people are saying, hey, freight market recovery is imminent. We actually have a couple charts here, starting with our outbound tender rejection index. We've got van outbound tenders light over the top of it. That is a number that is above 5%. And it, it's maybe like just a small baby sign but it's a sign. It's a really great sign. Now, looking at this data here, year over year, this time last year, rejection rates for the dry van, 3.76. We didn't cross 4% until like, let's look here, the last week of August. Dry van tender rejection rates, by the way, did not pick up over 4% until October. This is a very positive sign, but we also need to take this in context. I'm not gonna call it as in the end yet, but I, I'm calling it as in it is fertile ground. And, and this is setting the market up to where if this sustains past July 4th, I'm going to wait two weeks. That's my goal. The first week, because this July 4th falls on a Thursday. So drivers may take off. They, it's it's going to be weird because of the middle part of the week. It's not clean like a weekend where I can do my working tractor ride for fleets. Uh, the second part is, will the drivers and will capacity return to an extent uh, where it's going to have an impact. Now, we see this also with spot rates. Spot rates are going up, and they are about eight cents higher all in for dry van compared to this time last year. So we know the conditions are good, but what I don't want to see is a pump fake. I'm very cautious. I've been burned before on Groundhog Day, so I know not to time my humorous predictions with animals or barbecues. Or uh, fireworks, for that matter, either. And I know people <laughs> yeah, are getting exactly. very excited. We've seen founder and CEO of FreightWaves, Craig Fuller, start to talk about these like rumblings in the container side of things. And as we know, it takes a little bit for it to bleed over into the freight space of things. But just really quickly before I let you go, are we cautiously optimistic, optimistic, or still cautiously pessimistic? I'm going to go with optimistic. Uh, as much as I'd like to say cautiously optimistic, I think this is fertile ground. Ken Adama with DAT, when they pulled their spot market data, they actually noted there's 25% more volumes year over year. We know that there are higher volumes. We know there's lower capacity. And we also know right now there's a Category 5 hurricane. Uh, for earliest one ever, first one in the season. We have a lot of stuff where, you know, if we talked about this in January, we really could not have predicted it would be such fertile ground and to such an extent that you know you can you can really feel a market turn if the right ingredients come into play so i'm going to be optimistic because there's really nowhere to go but up this down cycle has been so long uh one thing i will hold my reservation for is it going to be a july august or september that's what we don't know so if it sustains past july 4th really good sign if not the volatility still a good sign there we go. All right, Thomas, thanks for joining us this morning for our community's update. Of course, you can find this week's episode of Loaded and Rolling on demand whenever you like up on our YouTube channel. Listen to it during your 4th of July barbecue. You can uh, inform your friends, and I promise you it won't be boring by playing it on any of our podcast players. We'll catch up with Thomas next week.